name is Joe Sarsanella. I'm an attorney that focuses on federal Indian law and policy, and currently I'm serving as the Senior Advisor and Liaison for Native American Affairs at the United States Department of Defense. Thank you for joining us for this training on sacred sites, and hopefully by the end of this training you will have all the knowledge that you will need to be prepared in the field. Let's begin. Native American Sacred Sites in the Federal Government a training for federal employees and contract staff developed under the Sacred Sites Memorandum of Understanding. Authority of Training On December 5, 2012, the Departments of Defense, the Interior, Agriculture, Energy, and the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation entered into a Memorandum of Understanding to improve the protection of and Indian access to sacred sites through interagency coordination and collaboration. The following training was developed under the MOU in coordination with subject matter experts from across the federal government, Indian country, and academia, and tribal advocacy groups. Training Overview Part 1, Native American Sacred Sites, Introduction and Background. Part 2, What is a Sacred Site? Part 3, Sacred Sites and the Law. Part 4, Guidance Toward Effective Sacred Site Consultations, Part 5, Moving Forward. Part 1, Native American Sacred Sites, Introduction and Background. Introduction. This training is for federal employees and contract staff to obtain a base understanding of sacred sites. While this training will not make you an expert, it will give you the tools necessary to assist with your legal obligations in the field. The concepts in this training pertain to American Indians and Alaska Natives. The terms Native, Indigenous, American Indian, Indian, and AIAN, which stands for American Indian Alaska Native, may be used interchangeably throughout the training unless otherwise noted. Background. Long before there was the United States of America, or any government established by European colonists throughout the Americas, countless Native nations existed. Each native nation was self-governed and possessed unique cultures and ways of life. Establishment of non-Indian governments from Canada through South America brought devastation to the native nations of the Americas. Historically, the United States government, as a means of acquiring Native American land and resources, systematically used federal policy to eliminate, forcefully assimilate, and destroy native life. Today, Despite the historical atrocities and great adversity, Native Americans continue to advocate for their indigenous sovereign rights and to be treated with the same dignity awarded to all Americans. As the federal government's policies towards Native Americans matures, federal actions are being taken to redress detrimental historic policies still adversely impacting Indian country. One major area where the federal government has taken action is the protection of Native American sacred sites, places, and landscapes on federally managed property and assuring Native American access. Such measures are positive steps in helping to heal over 200 years of detrimental federal Indian policy. It can be difficult to understand the integral connection between specific land and survival of an entire culture. Many people are familiar with the major world religions. If a church, mosque, temple, or place of worship is tragically destroyed, one may continue to pray or congregate. The building, the structure, the place does not define the practitioner's ability to exercise their beliefs. That is not always true for Native Americans. For Native American nations, many religious, spiritual, medicinal, and cultural practices are linked to a very specific geographical location. If that specific sacred site, place, and or landscape no longer existed or was inaccessible to Native people, those specific religions, spiritual, medicinal, and cultural practices would no longer survive. The cultural practice may be defined by the place. There is no ability to practice their culture elsewhere. Simply another part of our Native population's culture is lost. Protection of these lands is necessary for the survival of America's unique indigenous histories, cultures, and religions. 
Native American history is the first history of the United States and is an integral part of the collective American heritage. Part two, what is a sacred site? This section offers an overview of what is a sacred site, differing definitions, and touches upon the complexity of the subject matter. Definition difficulties. Sacred site is a term that is often used in the legal and regulatory world, meaning a very specific and defined geographic location that is of cultural significance to an Indian tribe. This is an incomplete definition of sacred sites in real life. Throughout this training, you will see the term sacred site, sacred places, and sacred landscape, often interchangeably. To many tribal nations, the term sacred place or sacred landscape are preferred because they do not limit the geographic boundary of the sacred land being discussed. This is an example. A burial ground is a sacred site. The hill where the burial ground is located is a sacred place. And the mountain range that the hill is part of is a sacred landscape, all of which are independently sacred and integrally connected to each other as a whole. This is just an example to illustrate concepts and not an actual rule. Sacred sites are often associated with a specific location with a larger traditional cultural landscapes or large geographic landscapes. Sacred places are particular sites, areas, and or landscapes possessing one or more attributes that distinguish them as extraordinary or significant, usually in a religious or spiritual sense. Sacred cultural landscapes are geographic areas that have special meaning for people that have a long standing or historical association relationship with a particular region. How a particular tribe defines a sacred site, place, or landscape can vary. A site of awe, mystery, power, fascination, attraction, oneness, danger, healing, ritual, identity, revelation, transformation, history, and or tragedy are all ways that a tribe may define a sacred site, or sacred place, or a sacred landscape. Examples. Land is, can be sacred. Soils, plants, rocks, dunes, hills, mountains, caves, volcanoes, forests, prairies, deserts, even animal impacts. Water can be sacred. Ocean and freshwater, coral reefs, islands, estuaries, mangroves, shores, beaches, marshes, spits, seagrass beds, sea arches, tides, waves, lakes, swamps, rivers, and other bodies of water. The sky can be sacred. Celestial events, star constellations, sunrise and sunset, moon phases. Humans. Ceremonial places involving man-made features, such as petroglyphs, pictographs, burial sites, structures, rock carns, rock alignments, rock shelters, trails, wells, and sites used for ceremonial purposes such as religious practices, collecting areas for plants or wildlife, celestial observations or markers, traditional cultural places, properties, and other items specific to an area. View sheds can be sacred. Areas that require unobstructed views of particular areas or events, such as a sunrise, star constellations, or moon phases. Tectonic activity, places that may be alive and dynamic, not static. They actively come into existence through naturally occurring phenomena, such as volcanoes, earthquakes. Places associated with all of these can be sacred places. Further understanding. For many Native American sacred sites, places, and landscapes often are not only geological, biological, cultural, geographical, pre and post contact, but may also be religious and spiritual. Some of these places may attract pilgrims and tourists because they are universally seen as unique, places such as Niagara Falls. It is not uncommon that individuals from many different tribal ecological, cultural, religious, and, na and national backgrounds may independently view the same place as sacred, such as the Grand Canyon. A particular sacred landscape may encompass many 
independent sacred sites and natural phenomenon, all of which are integrally connected parts of the same entire sacred landscape. For example, Mount Shasta in Northern California is considered a sacred landscape by the Wintu and several other American Indian cultures of the region. However, each individual waterfall, spring, cave, or meadow that comprise Mount Shasta have independent sacredness, but are all still interconnected part of the whole sacred landscape. Sacred places can be connected by rivers or lakes, legends and stories, the histories of individuals or groups, and or pilgrimage routes, for example, the Zuni Salt Lake in New Mexico. Other sacred places may have cultural limitations on human access, either being forbidden access or strictly limited to a ritual, spiritualist, healers, or elders. Example, traditionally for the Lakota, areas of the Black Hills of South Dakota were reserved for holy people. Federal and private land ownership inhibits such practices today. Many natives rely on naturally grown or occurring substances for religious and ceremonial purposes. Specifically, wildlife, plants, and minerals may be worn, carried, or presented during specific cultural practices. These items may be found in areas identified as sacred. Sometimes, items must be collected from very specific sacred sites, places, and landscapes for cultural practices and any desecration to the area renders these necessary resources unusable, ending certain cultural practices. See the Snow Bowl in the Navajo Nation. The tribe views the permittee actions as desecration. The federal government and the courts disagree. Native American Concepts Multiple tribes may hold the same land as sacred for similar or different reasons. Physical evidence of use may or may not be present at such places. Certain ceremonial practices may be required when entering or leaving sacred land. Traditional native names of sacred places, sites, and landscapes are extremely important. Due to historic detrimental federal policies, some knowledge of sacred sites, places, and landscapes has been lost. Sacred sites, places, and landscapes need to be considered from native perspectives, including locations, resources, etc., all of which may be less obvious or discoverable by non-native methods of identification. Sacred sites, places, and landscapes encompass more than archeological or historic sites. They can be natural sites where no physical evidence of their importance is obvious and may be ceremonial. Through archival, ethnographic, or ethno-historical research, including oral and traditional histories, some sacred places and ceremonial practices are being revived by tribes. Great care must be taken to identify and describe sacred sites, places, and landscapes, often through special methods of documentation by traditional practitioners or elders. Summary. Sacred sites, places, and landscapes go by many different names, may include any aspect of the natural world, and are integral parts of native cultures. Evidence of human activity at a sacred area may or may not be present. Native involvement when collecting information on a sacred site, place, and or landscape is crucial and necessary. Showing respect for sacred sites, places, and landscapes is showing respect to those who deem such places sacred. Sacred sites, places, and landscapes may include which of the following? A. Water features B. View sheds C. No evidence of human use D. All of the above The answer is D. All of the above. Part 3. Sacred Sites and the Law. This section provides a brief overview of legal concepts for non-lawyers. Please share and discuss the entire training with your legal counsel. Origins of the Trust Responsibility. 
The Federal Trust Responsibility, or Doctrine, is a core concept of federal Indian law. The doctrine has its origins in two cases decided by Chief Justice John Marshall and the Supreme Court in the 1830s. Together with Johnson v. McIntosh, decided in 1823, these cases make up what is commonly referred to in Indian law as the Marshall Trilogy. In 1831, the Supreme Court first suggested the existence of a trust relationship between the United States and American Indians in Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. Cherokee Nation presented a constitutional challenge to Georgia's attempt to extend its state laws to residents of the Cherokee Reservation. The Cherokee brought the case directly to the Supreme Court, relying on the court's original jurisdiction over cases between a state and a foreign nation. Chief Justice Marshall's majority opinion concluded that the Cherokee did not constitute a foreign nation. In doing so, he characterized the Cherokee as a domestic dependent nation in a state of pupillage, their relationship to the United States resembling that of a ward to his guardian. Thus, the tribe was out of court. While Marshall did not attempt to spell out the contours of the guardian-ward relationship, his statements served as a conceptual basis for further evolution of both the trust responsibility and, regrettably, the so-called plenary power doctrine, giving Congress almost unlimited authority over tribal relations. Thus, some 50 years later, drawing on this rather paternalistic language, the Supreme Court upheld both the Major Crimes Act and the General Allotment or Dawes Act with devastating effects on both tribal sovereignty and tribal control over its lands. Fortunately, the Cherokee question returned to the Supreme Court the very next term, giving Chief Justice Marshall a chance to further elaborate on the nature of the trust responsibility. In a strongly worded opinion, devoid of any mention of guardian-ward relationship, Marshall declared that tribes were distinct in separate political communities with sovereignty over their retained lands. His opinion clearly established the jurisdictional principle that states do not have power over Indian affairs. Only the federal government may negotiate with and exercise jurisdiction over the tribal nations. And perhaps, most importantly, in the context of protection for sacred sites, Marshall declared that in return for the tribes ceding vast amounts of land to the United States, the federal government obligated itself to protect the tribes from encroachment by the states and white settlers. This duty of protection, the heart of the trust doctrine, was predicated not on some misbegotten sense that the tribes were helpless and dependent nations, but was instead recognized as the bargain for consideration for the tribal lands sessions. The duty of protection. In Marshall's day, the duty of protection was clearly intended to protect tribal lands and tribal self-government from the insatiable demands of white settlers moving ever westward in the search for cheap and, in their mind's eye, unsettled land. Today, while the duty of protection is still often related to incompatible development and encroachment affecting Indian lands, tribal concerns are more often related to environmental threats and disturbances to Indian sacred sites, graves, and other traditional cultural properties. Satisfying the trust responsibility. Although sometimes viewed as a matter of concern principally for the Department of Interior and the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the trust responsibility extends to all federal agencies and the actions they take that may affect Indian lands, resources, sacred sites, and other traditional cultural properties. Current law provides that while the trust responsibility constitutes a moral obligation of general applicability, it is enforceable only to the extent it is embodied in a specific legal requirement. As a consequence, the trust responsibility typically may be satisfied by agency compliance with laws of general application. That said, 
Where agency officials have discretion in the administration of federal programs, the courts have regularly upheld the trust responsibility as a source of authority for federal action benefiting tribes. For example, when the Corps of Engineers relied on the trust responsibility to deny a permit for a fish farm in Puget Sound that would have interfered with tribal fishing rights, the district court upheld the Corps' decision. Similarly, when the Department of Commerce relied on the trust responsibility to issue an emergency regulation to limit the ocean harvest of Chinook salmon by commercial fishermen to preserve a share of the run for Indian fishermen, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the decision. These and other similar decisions establish that when federal officials appropriately consider the trust responsibility in the decision-making process, their decisions will be sustained. The upshot. The trust responsibility represents the duty the United States owes the tribes as particular compensation for the vast amount of land the tribes surrendered. It should be interpreted broadly and applied generously to ensure remaining tribal lands are not adversely affected by federal agency actions, nor access denied to those sacred and traditional cultural sites that are central to the maintenance of a tribe's cultural identity and indeed its continued existence. Treaty Rights From the first treaty with the Delaware in 1787 until the end of treaty making in 1871, hundreds of agreements were entered into between the federal government and various Indian tribes and bands. Ratified Indian treaties stand on essentially the same footing as treaties with foreign nations and are enforceable as the supreme law of the land. Treaty rights are not lost through non-use nor diminished by the passage of time. In addition to the beneficial ownership of Indian lands, treaty rights may include hunting, fishing, and gathering rights on ceded or aboriginal lands and entitlement to certain federal services such as education and health care. To compensate for the disadvantage at which the treaty-making process placed the tribes and to carry out the trust responsibility, the Supreme Court has fashioned rules of construction sympathetic to Indian interests. Notably, treaties are to be construed as they were understood by the tribal representatives who participated in their negotiations. For example, treaties in the Pacific Northwest reserved to Indians the right to take fish at customary locations in common with citizens of the territory. The courts have interpreted this language to guarantee treaty fishermen up to half of the harvestable fish, not merely the opportunity to fish alongside non-Indians, because the Indians at the time would have understood the treaties to have ensured their in eternal access to the fish needed to meet their subsistence and cultural needs. Although many people assume that any changes to treaty terms would need to be negotiated between the federal government and the tribes, such is not the case. Congress has the power to unilaterally abrogate Indian treaties. Although any such abrogation must be clear and unambiguous, also, abrogation of a treaty may give rise to a claim for compensation when the abrogation destroys a property right. The abrogation itself is effective, but the tribe is entitled to a claim for a taking under the Fifth Amendment. Indians and the Free Exercise of Religion Many Indian religious beliefs and practices center on particular places. Many of these places may be on federal lands outside of any reservation. In these cases, federal management may interfere substantially with Indian religious uses. Reliance on the Free Exercise Clause Historically, Indians seek to block federal action on religious grounds were required to prove a violation of the First Amendment Free Exercise Clause. Typically, the lower courts resolved such controversies by balancing the governmental interests and developing the particular project against the burden it placed on Indian religion. The balancing nearly 
always came out in favor of the government. American Indian Religious Freedom Act. In recognition of this problem, Congress in 1978 enacted the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. Ten years later, however, several Indian tribes in California sought to use the American Indian Religious Freedom Act to prevent the Forest Service from constructing a logging road through national forest lands where the tribes had worshipped since time immemorial. Despite evidence that the road would render the practice of the tribe's religion almost impossible, the Supreme Court determined that the American Indian Religious Freedom Act expressed merely a sense of Congress and created no rights enforceable in a court of law. Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993 In 1993, Congress enacted the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Not focused exclusively on Indians, this act prohibits the federal government from substantially burdening a person's exercise of religion unless it can show that the burden furthers a compelling governmental interest and is the least restrictive means of furthering that interest. But when the Navajo Nation and several other tribes attempted to use the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to block a ski resort located on the sacred San Francisco peaks from using treated sewage effluent to make artificial snow, the Ninth Circuit ruled that the use was not a substantial burden on the tribe's religious freedom. Substantial burden, the court argued, only occurred if an individual was forced to choose between following the tenets of his or her religious beliefs or receiving government benefit or coerced to act contrary to his or her religious beliefs by the threat of civil or criminal sanctions. The tribes petitioned for certiori, but the Supreme Court denied the tribes' petition, upholding the Ninth Circuit's decision. Indian Sacred Sites In 1996, President Clinton issued Executive Order 13007, directing agencies administering federal lands to accommodate access to and ceremonial use of Indian religious sites to the extent practical and not inconsistent with essential agency functions. Despite a rather cramped definition of sacred sites, as well as the fact that executive orders are not legally enforceable, this executive order has had a very salutary effect. Since its issuance, the federal land managing agencies have substantially increased their efforts to identify areas of Indian religious and cultural sensitivity on the lands they manage and to accommodate tribal requests for access. Statutes Supporting Sacred Site Protection We will next examine three statutes that provide a degree of legal protection for sacred sites. National Historic Preservation Act The NHPA is the nation's principal historic preservation statute it applies to the federal undertakings anywhere in the United States that may affect a property currently listed or eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. A federal undertaking is a project or program carried out by or on behalf of a federal agency or with federal financial assistance or one requiring a federal permit or license. It is important to note that the NHPA provides the same protections to properties eligible for listing on the register as it does for properties already listed on the register. This is important with respect to Indian sacred sites, as many tribes prefer that the precise location of these sites remain confidential. A federal agency that proposes an undertaking that may affect a listed or register eligible historic property must, before proceeding, consult with the appropriate state historic preservation office and or tribal historic preservation officer and take into account the effect of the undertaking on all such historic properties. This is accomplished by following the section 106 process which is detailed in the regulations 
at Title 36, Part 800 of the Code of Federal Regulations. In 1992, the National Historic Preservation Act was amended to assist Indian tribes in protecting their historic properties and preserving their traditional values. First, the amendments expanded the meaning of significance when evaluating Native American properties to explicitly recognize religious significance, a factor not included when evaluating non-tribal properties. Second, the amendments carved out a role for a tribal representative, known as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, or THPO, or TIPO, who can assume all or part of the functions of a State Historic Preservation Officer for undertakings on tribal lands, and must be consulted with concerning traditional cultural properties off of tribal lands in conjunction with the SHPO. A key component of the Part 800 process is the requirement that federal agencies, in consultation with the relevant Indian tribes or Native Hawaiian organizations, make a reasonable and good faith effort to identify the presence of any traditional cultural or other historic properties that may be affected by a proposed undertaking. This is a demanding standard. The Pueblo of Sandia case cited on the slide provides important guidance on meeting this obligation. Archaeological Resources Protection Act The Archaeological Resources Protection Act covers the disturbance or removal of archaeological resources located on public or Indian lands. Before a permit may be granted to permit the excavation of an archaeological resource on public lands of religious or cultural importance to any Indian tribe, the federal land manager must consult with the relevant tribe or tribes concerning the terms and conditions of the permit. For permits for the excavation of any archaeological resource located on Indian lands, the consent of the Indian tribe having jurisdiction over such lands must be obtained. Some archaeological resources may be deemed eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. In these cases, the 36 CFR Part 800 process discussed previously must be followed. Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act NAGPRA protects Native American human remains and other cultural items through provisions for disposition and repatriation of such remains and items. Provisions governing intentional excavations and inadvertent discoveries and by making trafficking in such remains and cultural items criminal. Anyone wishing to intentionally excavate or remove Native American human remains or cultural items from federal or tribal lands must consult with the appropriate Indian tribe or, when appropriate, Native Hawaiian organization with a cultural affiliation with the remains or objects. Obtain a permit under the Archaeological Resource Protection Act and transfer any NAGPRA human remains or cultural items discovered during the excavation as required by the Act generally to lineal descendants, Indian tribes, or Native Hawaiian organizations that have been determined to be priority claimants. NAGPRA also deals with Native American human remains or cultural items inadvertently discovered on federal or tribal lands during construction or other ground disturbing activities. When Native American human remains or cultural items are inadvertently discovered, all work in the vicinity must immediately cease. The human remains and cultural items must be protected and notification must be provided to the relevant federal agency or Indian tribal official. Work may resume after 30 days, although if human remains or cultural items must be removed to make way for the construction or other activities, the requirements for an intentional excavation must first be satisfied. For obvious reasons, it is almost always preferred to prevent the disturbance of Native American human remains and cultural items and avoid work stoppages. To that end, advanced consultation 
with the Indian tribes or Native Hawaiian organizations culturally affiliated with the site concerning what to do if human remains or cultural items are encountered is highly recommended. Consultation with Tribal Governments In addition to the Sacred Sites Executive Order discussed earlier, Executive Order 13175 issued by President Clinton requires federal agencies to consult with tribes before implementing any policies, proposed legislation, or regulations that may affect treaty rights, tribal self-government, or tribal trust resources. Significantly, this order requires agencies to use consensus-based mechanisms for developing policies, legislation, and regulations affecting Indian tribes. Presidential Memos on Government-to-Government -government Relations Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama have each acknowledged the unique legal and political relationship between the United States and the Indian tribes, and each has directed federal agencies to engage in good faith and meaningful consultation before taking actions that may have a substantial effect on tribal rights and resources. Farm Bill 2008 in the 2008 Farm Bill, Congress enacted legislation to strengthen support for the policy of the United States of protecting and preserving the traditional cultural and ceremonial rights and practices of Native American tribes. The statute included language permitting reburial of human remains and cultural items on National Forest Service land, temporary closure of portions of National Forests for tribal, traditional, cultural, and religious purposes, tribal use free of charge of trees, parts of trees, or forest products from national forest land for traditional cultural purposes, and protection of the confidentiality of certain culturally sensitive information from disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, UNDRIP. The UN DRIP. In December 2010, the United States announced support for the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, or UNDRIP or UNDRIP. In announcing support, President Obama stated, the aspirations it affirms, including respect for the institutions and rich cultures of Native people, are ones we must always seek to fulfill. What matters far more than any resolution or declaration are actions to match those words. The UN DRIP is a non-binding. It creates no new rights under U.S. or international law, nor is it a statement of current international law. Its articles address, among other matters, the rights of indigenous peoples to maintain their customs, religious traditions, cultures, and ceremonies, to participate in decision-making on matters that may affect their rights and to maintain spiritual connections to traditionally occupied lands. Importance of the Declaration Although the UN DRIP is currently only aspirational, it serves as a powerful affirmation of Indian rights and adds a new dimension to federal tribal relations. It remains to be seen whether the document will inspire changes in the United States' current policies affecting indigenous peoples, but the UN DRIP clearly establishes an agenda of important issues in Indian country, warranting increased consultation between the United States and its Indian nations. Summary. Continued access to sacred sites is critically important if Indian tribes are to maintain their cultural identity. The federal government plays a central role in protecting these sites, both through its scrupulous compliance with the statutes and executive orders discussed in this part, and by acknowledging the duty of protection, the federal trust responsibility, that was promised as consideration for the land ceded to the United States by the Indian tribes. As the eminent Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black once ardently stated in reference to an Indian treaty violation, Great nations, like great men, should keep their word. Which of the following is true regarding the federal trust responsibility? A. 
It was established by the Supreme Court under the Marshall Trilogy. B. It requires acting in the best interest of tribes. C. It is an independent basis for federal action benefiting tribes. D. All of the above. The correct answer is D, all of the above. Part 4. Guidance for Effective Sacred Place Consultations. This section offers guidance for working with tribes and is presented from tribal viewpoints. Please explore links to case studies provided throughout this section. General Considerations for Effective Consultations. Tribes may have rules or protocols for sharing information about locations, meanings, and oral histories of sacred sites, places, and landscapes. Rules or protocols may also dictate when, where, and with whom a sacred site, place, or landscape may be discussed. Many tribes cannot discuss a sacred site, place, or landscape during certain times of the day, night, or year. For example, a place used only for fall ceremonies that cannot be discussed during other seasons of the year. Protection of sacred sites, places, and landscapes can only occur through ongoing meaningful and respectful consultation with tribal governments and their appropriate and knowledgeable native practitioners and elders. For example, for some tribes, only specific people are allowed to interpret a sacred site, place, and landscape and speak on behalf of the place. During government-to-government -government consultation, ask who the appropriate and knowledgeable individuals are for consultation regarding a specific sacred site, place, and landscape. Native place names of sacred sites, places, and landscapes should be used and respected at all times. Many natives consider burial areas sacred and feel the ancestor spirits are still present at these places. Such topics deserve special consideration, sensitivity, and respect. Below are consultation guidelines for the 106 process, but they are beneficial examples for other consultation purposes. Best Practices Communication Initiate and maintain ongoing communication with tribes with historic and or contemporary ties to the federal land base. Communication should continue outside of formal consultations in addition to during the consultation process. Regular ongoing communication will build trust, confidence, and will foster positive relationships and partnerships with tribes. Engage intertribal or regional tribal associations if possible and appropriate. Remember, the federal government forcibly removed many tribes from their ancestral homelands, and some of those tribes have settled halfway across the country. It is necessary to know what tribes have an ancestral tie to any specific area of land, so they may be formally engaged in any consultation. Some tribes have historic ties to lands far removed from their current land base and need to be consulted with regarding sacred sites, places, and landscapes in their original territory. For example, the Okmulgee Mounds, Georgia, are sacred to the Muscogee Creek Nation, now in Oklahoma, following forced removal in the 1830s. The mounds are protected in part as the Okmulgee National Monument under National Park Service jurisdiction. Involve tribes in every stage of sacred places protection, from planning through implementation and shared information, data, and relevant files during the earliest consultation phase. Develop agreements regarding general locations and concerns of sacred sites, places, and landscapes. Incorporate shared information agreed to by all parties into meaningful National Register determinations of eligibility. Reach and implement terms of agreements, memorandums of agreement, MOA, memorandums of understanding, MOU, etc., as quickly as possible. Discuss planned administrative conveyances of land and recommendations for congressional conveyance of land. For example, Secretary of the Interior conveyed into trust 120 acres of Bear Butte, South Dakota, 
to the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes in 1979 for the use by all tribes with cultural relationships to the site. Communicate within your agency regarding the need to protect sacred places, the nature of any ongoing agreements and how well they are working, topics for future consultations, how federal agencies have protected or are currently protecting sacred sites, consider consulting about sacred land a privilege and treat all shared information with the greatest respect. Best Practices Access and Mitigating Impact More than one tribe can ascribe meaning to sacred sites, places, and landscapes on land or in water. For example, the Oneida of Wisconsin live on lands held in trust for them near Lake Michigan. Ho-Chunk, to their west today, ancestors are buried on that reservation and the Oneida contact Ho-Chunk elders when Ho-Chunk burials are discovered so they can care for their ancestors in their traditional way. It may be inappropriate for non-tribal people to visit places sacred to tribes or visiting may cause irreparable damage to the site. Consider the impact of encroaching tourism such as rock climbing and other recreational activities that may cause damage. For example, Cave Rock on the shore of Lake Tahoe, Nevada was closed to climbers by the U.S. Forest Service through a management plan it developed. The area is still accessible to hikers, but considered a sacred place by the Washoe people. Consider treaty and or court-affirmed management and use of sacred sites, places, and landscape, and develop plans to allow access routes to remain as unencumbered as possible with agreements regarding route maintenance. For example, in the Pacific Northwest, treaty rights exist to fish, gather, hunt for ceremonial, commercial, and subsistence purposes at tribes' usual and accustomed places in the Pacific Northwest and Columbia River. Another example in the Great Lakes, similar treaty rights exist on tribes' ceded lands in the Great Lakes states. Develop use agreements with tribes for sacred sites, places, and landscapes used to gather traditional products, plants, and animals, and agreements for co-management and joint stewardship of sacred land. For example, Casha Cataway Tent Rocks National Monument in New Mexico is co-managed by the Bureau of Land Management and Acocha de Pueblo. The agreement includes closures without notice by the Pueblo, non-disclosure of private information regarding specific religious or cultural places, and other items that can be used as model terms of agreements. Best Practices Maintaining Confidentiality Create inventories of sacred sites, places, and landscapes on federal land. Inventories should not be considered final and may be expanded by either federal agencies or tribes. Develop buffer zones around sacred sites, places, and landscapes that will be avoided in planning and all stages of projects and protect locations from inadvertent impacts. For example, the BLM and traditional religious leaders devised the inkblot system for the California Desert Plan. An inked shape designates a sensitive area without dis disclosing the exact location of the sacred place. Ink blotted areas are non-development or non-encroachment areas. Consult with tribes regarding closures and to develop alternative marker systems that indicate off-limit areas. For example, federal agencies can use a range of signage when tribes require closure for stewardship, ceremonial, or observational purposes. Military installations often protect sites by making them off-limits. One form of alternative marker system is to incorporate protected sites into military exercises while keeping them off-limits. Fully consider direct, indirect, and cumulative impacts to sacred sites, places, and landscapes during environmental remediation activities. Adopt the principle that sacred is sacred and that sacredness is determined by tribes. Important practices to avoid. 
The following is a list of practices that should be avoided in the field of sacred sites. Requesting exact information about sacred sites, places, and landscapes when locations are not already public. Creating public maps or other locational indicators outlining sacred sites, places, and landscapes. Requiring tribes to document or detail how places, ceremonies, events, or activities are sacred. Repeated requests for similar information. Granting use permits to or entering into agreements with non-native persons or entities without consultation with tribes or over their objections. Delegating consultation responsibility to archaeological consultants. Consultation is a federal government-to-government -government responsibility and should not be contracted out. Relying on non-tribal subject matter experts over tribal experts. Non-tribal experts may dismiss sacred landscape features as non-Indian. Discussions and processes that attempt to characterize entire classes or types of sites and sacred sites, places, and landscapes. For example, all carns in New England are stone piles made by colonial farmers is not a true statement. Take all possible steps to avoid litigation with tribes over protecting sacred sites, places, and landscapes. Tribes across the country claim the primary factors leading to litigation over sacred places is federal agency lack of respect, recognition, and or consultation. For example, San Francisco Peaks or Arizona Snowball was a controversial case. Tribes lost their battle to prevent spraying of treated sewage for snowmaking on a sacred mountain. This is an example of how difficult such cases can be. The federal government and the courts believe this case was properly decided. Tribes disagree and the Navajo Nation voices that opinion regularly, even citing so to the United Nations in Geneva. Structures from the colonial or post-colonial period, such as a Christian mission or church, can be just as sacred to Native Americans as a 10,000-year-old archaeological site. The San Francisco de Assisi Mission Church, Ranchos de Taos, New Mexico, is a blend of Native and Spanish styles and a National Historic Landmark. This symbol of a more recent place important to Indians across the country recalls the occupation of Alcatraz Island, California, and the beginning of the American Indian Movement, AIM, in the early 1970s. Native Americans continue to make pilgrimages to Alcatraz for Indigenous Day sunrise gatherings, Columbus Day, to commemorate the 1969 to 1971 occupation. Summary. This section provides guidance and best practices for tribal consultation. Consult frequently and often with tribes, local and removed. Keep an open dialogue. Listen to tribal experts and accept their expertise. Mitigate impacts whenever possible and always protect and make concessions for access. Take action to protect confidentiality of sacred sites, places, and landscapes. Be creative in approaches to protecting sites and learn from best practices while being aware of practices to avoid. True or false, federal agencies should take steps to protect the confidentiality of sacred sites, places, and landscapes. The correct answer is true. Part five, moving forward. This section explains tribal concerns regarding the protection of sacred sites, places, and landscapes, explores ideas for positively addressing those concerns and is followed by an overview of the Interagency Memorandum of Understanding for the Protection of Indian Sacred Sites and the White House Council on Native American Affairs. Tribal Concerns Confidentiality Many tribes avoid sharing confidential information about sacred sites, places, and landscapes with outsiders. Disclosing specific details like location and significance may be taboo. Tribes want assurance that any disclosed information is protected and managed sensitively. 
Many federal tribal partnerships include confidentiality or data sharing agreements, outlining how information is stored, accessed, and appropriately used. Often a federal agency does not retain any sensitive data. It is housed with the tribe and an agreement details how it will be accessed by an agency and to what they will have access. Formalized consultation protocols. Federal agencies are encouraged to establish formal government-to-government -government consultation protocols with tribes, including MOUs and MOAs outlining the consultation process, opportunities for collaboration and coordination on specific issues, points of contacts, authorities, responsibilities, etc. Management and protection. Tribes are more likely to trust a federal agency with sensitive, confidential information when well-maintained working relationships have been established. Establish such relationships around non-contentious projects so there is a level of trust when more difficult projects arise. Federal agencies can foster true government-to-government -government relationships with tribes by working together through land management decisions, such as how will the site be managed, protected, and used by the land manager or the public? How will tribal access be accommodated? Most tribal federal agency interactions can be detailed in a formalized agreement that outlines specific procedures for tribal access and use, uses by federal agencies that do not conflict with tribal use, dispute resolution processes, and any pertinent federal laws, rules, regulations, and jurisdictions. Develop a consultation protocol in accordance with Executive Order 13175. Although federal agency-specific consultation guidance may exist, a federal agency should conduct outreach to tribal governments to see how they want to be consulted. Some tribes have their own consultation protocols, and a federal agency should be accommodating to their process. A tribe may identify key policymakers and staff to consult with, and the federal agency should do the same. Federal agency tracking system for consultation should be in place and reported annually. A federal agency must ensure a reasonable and good faith effort to consult with tribes. Agencies and tribes should document the consultation processes. If more than one federal agency is involved, it is imperative for interagency communication and coordination. Tribes should create a written record of interactions in the event consultation fails and issues are elevated to a higher level, including litigation. All consultations should be reported annually as part of the OMB Annual Report on Executive Order 13175. Consultation Processes and Tribal Policies Ask a tribe if it has a tribal policy on sacred sites, places, and landscapes, or any other applicable laws or policies. Ask for a copy for your records and reference. Know this policy when consulting with the tribe and try to apply the policy into land management decisions if possible. Model the successful strategies of other federal agencies that have good working relationships or consultation processes with a tribe or tribes on sacred sites, places, and landscapes. A federal agency should ask a tribe if it has good working relationships with other federal or state agencies and then strive to create a similar relationship or consultation process. Don't reinvent the wheel. Agency Tribal Liaisons Federal agency tribal liaisons should be involved in consultations with tribes. Agency tribal liaisons should make themselves known to tribes so tribes know who to work with and so their expertise can be utilized to address tribal concerns and issues. It is imperative that agency tribal liaisons create meaningful relationships with the tribes and conduct frequent outreach. Typically, the tribal liaison can elevate issues and concerns or assist in resolution of an issue or concern. 
The Role of Tribes in Consultations Tribes should be consulted throughout the entire project processes from start, the planning phase, to finish. This will ensure tribes can offer insight early in the process, sometimes offering solutions or identifying problems not thought of by the agency. Working through issues together early on can help move the project along more smoothly and quickly. Consultation includes asking tribes their ideas or thoughts on future implementation of sacred sites issues. Steps to effectively consult with tribal governments. Number one, identify the appropriate tribe or tribes for your project. This may include removed tribes. Learn the historical tribal territories for the area. Number two, establish a relationship with tribes at various levels of the organization. Ideally, do this when there isn't a contentious project to build a level of trust and goodwill that will serve everyone well when a difficult project happens. Number three, develop a consultation agreement. Number four, develop a data sharing agreement. Number five, identify funding for tribes to inventory sacred sites, places, and landscapes if a land managing agency is involved. Do not assume that tribes have this data available or in a form that the agency can use. If an inventory is proactive, the agency can make better management decisions to protect sites rather than finding out about the site after a project is proposed. Number six, change the conversation. Tribes want federal agencies to understand and support why tribes find these places important. MOU for the Protection of Indian Sacred Sites. There is an ongoing dialogue and awareness within the federal government regarding sacred sites, places, and landscapes. The 2012 Sacred Sites MOU was created to formalize interagency collaboration and communication between the U.S. Departments of Defense, Interior, Agriculture, Energy, and the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. The goal is to establish federal standards for guidance, public education, and outreach, confidentiality, management practices, federal protections, interagency collaborations, and tribal consultation for the protection, management, and stewardship of sacred land. Working together and learning from each other is the best way to successfully implement the goals of the MOU. The White House Council on Native American Affairs Established by President Obama in 2013 to ensure the federal government engages in true and lasting government-to-government -government relationships with federally recognized tribes in a more coordinated and effective manner. This includes fulfillment of trust responsibilities, protecting tribal lands, environments, and natural resources, and promoting respect for tribal cultures. The council membership includes the Secretary of Interior, who is the chair, along with the heads of executive departments, agencies, and offices. They meet three times a year with additional meetings and invitees as determined by the chair. All products developed under the Sacred Sites MOU are formally adopted by the White House Council on Native American Affairs. The Council's mission and function is to make policy recommendations to the President, coordinate the United States government's engagement with tribal governments and their communities, coordinate a more effective and efficient process for tribal consultation as set forth in Executive Order 13175, and organize White House Tribal Nations Conference each year. Tribes should be able to advocate for their sacred sites, places, and landscapes to the Council, including suggesting policy recommendations and improvements to tribal consultation. Tribes may also address issues they are having with federal agencies at the regional offices and or headquarters. Summary. 
This section explored some major concerns of tribes regarding the protection of sacred sites, places, and landscapes, and tribal interests in those places. It then examined ideas for moving forward positively in addressing these concerns and interests. This was followed by an overview of the Interagency Sacred Sites MOU and the White House Council on Native American Affairs. Federal agencies should do which of the following when working with tribal governments? A. Formalize consultation protocol agreements with tribes. B. Ensure tribes have access to sacred sites. C. Accept tribal histories and narratives regarding sacred sites. D. All of the above. The correct answer is D. All of the above. Acknowledgements. The Kaishia Band of Pomo. Red Lake Band of Chippewa. Pueblo of Santa Ana. Confederated Tribes of Umatilla. The Navajo Nation. The Coeur d'Alene. National Congress of American Indians. Native American Rights Fund. The Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. Morningstar Institute. Association of American Indian Affairs, Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at ASU Indian Legal Program, University of Arkansas School of Law, the National Park Service, the Department of Justice, and the U.S. Forest Service. The signatories of the Sacred Sites MOU thank all of the aforementioned with their assistance in the creation of this training. Remember, sacred places deserve respect, and additionally, Respect is merited for the people, cultures, and belief systems that consider such sites sacred. The purposeful desecration of a sacred site, place, or landscape is demoralizing and dehumanizing to those who hold it sacred. I thank you very much for joining me today for this training. Please remember to print out these slides and keep it as a reference. Have a wonderful day.